Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Hello and welcome again uh, to uh, this worship as we gather on this sixth Sunday of the Easter season. And again, uh, this week I simply encourage you to have uh, bread and wine or grape juice uh, prepared. And uh, if you like, uh, to light a candle, uh, symbolic of the Spirit's presence with us in this time uh, together in word and sacrament. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you. Today we're uh, focusing again on this uh, first uh, letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Uh, and this week, the 13th chapter, which has uh, typically been referred to as the love chapter. Uh, in the email that came out uh, this past Thursday, in the scripture readings, I included uh, three um, versions of this uh, text, um, including one from the message. And so that's the one I'm going to uh, uh, read from today. Uh, sometimes... Uh, when we hear a familiar passage um, in, uh, shared in words that aren't familiar, perhaps it will help us to focus a little more and uh, trigger within us uh, thinking about uh, things that we might have simply overlooked in hearing a familiar passage uh, over again. And so here we are from the message by Eugene Peterson, uh, the first Letter of Paul to the Corinthians, the 13th chapter. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't have love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't have love. I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with everything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday, Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth. And what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, our incompletes will be canceled. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like any infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. We don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then, see it all as clearly as God sees us knowing him directly, just as he knows us. But for right now, 
until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us toward that consummation. Trust steadily in God. Hope unswervingly. Love extravagantly. And the best of the three is love. Would it surprise you if I told you that uh, the Apostle Paul did not write these words for a wedding? But that's probably where we have most often uh, heard these words. A wedding as we celebrate human love between two people and look to the deeper meanings of God's love that give meaning to our human expressions of love. So we might ask, what was the original context for this Corinthian congregation as Paul addressed these words to them? And then uh, let's take, do that briefly, and then we'll also ponder again how these words uh, speak to us today. As mentioned last week, uh, Corinth uh, was a cosmopolitan city on a very important trade route. And not surprisingly, therefore, there would be a great diversity of people represented within Corinth. And likewise, the gathering of people that gathered with Paul in this new Corinthian congregation would represent a wide diversity of backgrounds. The Corinthian congregation was not a homogeneous gathering. It represented all the um, conventional social boundaries of ethnicity, gender, age, rank, status, and life situation at that time in Corinth and around the Mediterranean of the Roman age. Uh, there were married and unmarried men and women in the congregation, widows and children, converted Gentiles and Jews, including former synagogue leaders. Uh, most, however, were probably lower classes of the lower classes, but there were others at the other extreme as well. Erastus, for example, was the city treasurer for Corinth. And Gaius had enough resources to support Paul and the entire congregation. And there were also slaves and free people, all with different skill sets and gifts. And so how do you bring all of these people uh, together in one gathering? The diversity within the Christ, uh, Corinthian congregation generated both benefits and challenges. And by the time Paul is writing to them, uh, the members of this Corinthian congregation are divided into contentious groups. There were divisions. There were sides taken against each other. And last week we uh, learned uh, that loyalty was an issue, as uh, some claimed loyalty to Paul and some to Apollos and some to Peter and some to Christ. Paul could have said that uh, the solution to this situation would simply be to have people gather in their own groups. Widows and orphans together in one group, the wealthy in another group, all the Norwegians stick together and the Italians in another group, all the Democrats in one group, and all the Trumpers in another. But Paul didn't say that. Instead, Paul affirms the diversity of the community as itself a gift from God. And in chapter 12, he uses the analogy of the human body with, uh, as a way to speak to all these distinctions and parts that come together to be the body of Christ. And as Paul says, indeed, the body does not consist of one member but of many. And he continues, if one member suffers, all suffer with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. 
And then Paul deals with uh, spiritual gifts and the tendency, even in the church, for some to feel more indispensable than others. Uh, for some uh, to be more proud of their gifts than others, more worthy than others. But what is the example of Christ as Paul states it? Superior to all these things is the kind of love that God demonstrates for us in God's steadfast love for us as imperfect human beings in the love of Christ. And then Paul pens these most beautiful words in this 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Paul argues, uh, and it comes to a conclusion that the only thing that never ends is love. Even faith will come to a time when it is no longer needed as we stand before the risen Christ. Even hope will come to a time when it is no longer needed as we are in the presence of God's promised kingdom. Only love, love is eternal. But this kind of love is not an easy love. It's not the feeling kind of love. It's not an emotional expression. It's a costly way of living and of loving. Beyond pride, beyond status, beyond all knowledge and all sense of self-importance. And for us as followers of the risen Christ, even as we recognize our inability to love to this measure, so in the power of the Holy Spirit, we trust that we have been infused with the power of Christ and with his love dwelling within us. And so, as Christ's people, as members of his body, we are always under compulsion to live in this kind of love, always called to embody Christ's love, always called to do that which is the expression of God's love. This is a tough love. It is not an easy kind of loving. Back in my uh, first congregation in uh, rural Nebraska, I would often think of this um, when it uh, came to uh, parents within my congregation who often had to deal with uh, familial ties at the time of the marriage of one of their children. Now, please understand that, uh, remember, this was uh, 30, 40 years ago, and it's not a blanket statement or cr criticism against the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. But rather, in the context of that time, it was not unusual for a couple that got married uh, there was a likely scenario that would often play out where if one uh, was a Roman Catholic, often the man, there was always often the presumption uh, that the families uh, the, the, uh, applied uh, by those families that the non-Catholic spouse would become Catholic and raise the children in the Catholic faith. And in small rural communities, a lot of local status and pride revolved around these kinds of arrangements. Yet often it was uh, parents in my congregation whom I believe out of a selfless sense of love, who often chose to continue to support their child and spouse in this new arrangement where their child's family would leave our congregation and be joined to the larger extended family of the other spouse in the local Catholic parish. In small uh, town rural uh, communities, this was an expression of swallowing pride, of 
engaging in a kind of love for the sake of love of their child and family, uh, a sense in some ways of a selfless love that sought to seek the bigger picture. Coincidentally, uh, during those years, I also heard a local uh, Catholic priest uh, speak before his congregation, before his parish, and express that over the years, it had been his experience, as he said, that the most exemplary Catholics were former Lutherans. Perhaps not the best example, but one of those uh, ways in which uh, the struggle for, for love can be real, and uh, that it sometimes feels costly. Uh, but the value of such love is that it has the ability uh, to bind us in a larger sense of community. And so this morning we're grateful again that Paul uh, has given us this passage as a touch point that we can come to again and again. And that it's not simply human love but it's the divine example of love that can and ought to be the measure of our love, empowered by the presence of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And so may this love, this costly kind of love of which Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 13, always be the measure of love as we gather, as an expression, as an expression of community, in Christ's love. For as Paul says, faith, hope, and love abide. All are important. All are necessary in our life of faith. But finally, it is as Paul says, that the greatest of these is love. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Group hug. In the night in which he is betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, given and shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.